Thank you so much. It's really a great pleasure to be here and to have this interdisciplinary and very international um, discussion. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I think there are a lot of connections between um, the work that I'm doing and the work that you and your colleagues are are uh, pursuing. So um, I've prepared some comments that are kind of an overview of what is a, a somewhat abstract and somewhat theoretical book, but one that I think is pretty relevant to public policy and and a lot of important policy debates. So let me just share my screen and I'll get started. Okay, so um, as you all are probably aware, there was a, a very important or, or very uh, well-publicized political protest in 2011 in New York City on Wall Street. And this sculpture of a bull uh, is a famous uh, sculpture that sits right in front of the main uh, Wall Street venue. And I've always found it interesting that the original poster that called protesters uh, to New York, to the Wall Street area, uh, to mount a protest about the distribution of, of wealth and income in the US, um, It included not only this image, this sort of icon of masculinity and of capitalism, the 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 bull, uh, but also this ballerina on top of the bull, who's not she's not uh, restraining it, she's not guiding it, uh, she's she's kind of observing it and trying to see where it goes and and stay with it, and I think that's kind of an interesting metaphor for what. Um, the feminist project that I'm a part of is really trying to do. Um, so uh, remember this image of, of the bull because I'm gonna come back to it at the end. So I think my most important starting point is that feminist political economy isn't just about gender inequality or or the grievances that women might have about uh, discrimination or other aspects of their personal experience. It's something that um, leads us towards a larger explanation of inequalities that are based not just on gender, but also on class, on race, ethnicity, on citizenship, and other dimensions of socially assigned group identity. And that that's arisen in part, I think, from the interaction of progressive activists who uh, have tried to find allies um, in the project of developing a more sustainable and equitable society, and have often been called out for putting too much emphasis on one particular dimension of identity and not really appreciating the complexity of the uh, hierarchical systems that we inhabit and that we're that we're trying to understand. So. Uh, this is the symbol that you, that you may recognize for the activist group called Extinction Rebellion. And um, to me, it's important as a reminder that most of modern economic theory is very much based on what is sometimes called methodological individualism. That is that people pursue their own self-interests we're not really gonna ask where their preferences come from or what they want. We're just gonna assume that everything will be fine if they can um, express themselves and reveal their preferences through, through economic choices. And I think that's a principle that works in some areas of the economy and not in others. It's clearly not working with respect to the physical environment uh, and the problems of climate change that we're facing. And I want to persuade you that it's also very problematic for the care economy that requires uh, some very mindful cooperation and institutional change in order to become sustainable. So uh, my basic um, my basic desire in the seminar is to persuade you 
that we need to really center the concept of care and to rethink some of the key words of political economy, like mode of production, social reproduction, exploitation, I think concepts that are very much, that are very widely used on the left, and I think are undergoing a kind of um, evolution away from their original meaning. Um, and it's, although it may seem like an abstract project, it's actually pretty crucial to an understanding of a lot of current political dilemmas. So um, what do I mean by care? Um, how am I defining it? First, let me just say, there's a lot of literature on this subject and I am not the ultimate authority. People differ in the way they define it. And that definition could be something that we would like to talk about or discuss after the seminar. But I define it, um, really in terms of the, the, the kind of output, what it's an activity that creates something and what it creates is human beings and human capabilities. So I'm gonna define it as the production, the development and the maintenance of human capabilities. It's a task that requires uh, at least some concern for the well-being of others. It's by its very nature, something that can't be performed entirely through self-interest unless we assume that people have completely bulletproof altruistic preferences um, that um, are sufficient uh, to solve the coordination problems involved. Care provision involves unpaid work, and that will be something I will talk about a lot today, but it also includes some categories of paid work, and it also includes transfers of money. Care provision is not, is not just about work. It's also about being able to finance and support um, the work of providing care. And Literally on a global level, it's pretty clear that women provide a disproportionate share of care. Uh, not, not all of it, but uh, more than half of it for, for sure. And that that um, provision of care is a source of economic vulnerability. And that's one of the, the, my explanation of why it contributes to their economic vulnerability is a big part of my, my argument. So, Maybe this reflects the, the way that I'm coming at this issue as an economist uh, and, and finding some of the language of social welfare economics and, and debates about public goods uh, that have come to the fore in thinking about environmental problems and climate change. I think it's, it's, it's also a very good frame for thinking about care provision because it, it is very difficult to individually capture the economic benefits of care because what you're producing is not something that's directly commodified. So there, there's, there's a, a role for commodity production in the, in, in the whole process, but human capabilities themselves um, have uh, very significant spillover effects. It's not just the individual who's the, who receives the care, who's the beneficiary. You know, there, there's a kind of an investment function that by creating the capabilities of ourselves and other people and of the next generation, we're creating benefits that, that are go far beyond um, what the individual recipient receives because they spill over in ways that facilitate um, the reproduction of the economy as a whole and larger processes of, of, uh, of cooperation. But um, precisely because it's a public good, uh, it's possible to uh, enjoy the benefits of care provision without really paying the cost. So in my view, distributional struggle over the distribution of the net benefits of care provision, that is how much you pay relative to how much you get, I think that's just as significant as struggle over surplus value. And um, I think that that's reflected in debates about the direction of the welfare state and also debates about immigration. Uh, because the, the nation state is itself a very important player in support for, uh, for care provision. Um, although that support has evolved in sort of almost chaotic ways over time, rather than being really theorized or, or, or formulated in very systematic 
social science terms. So I hope you can see already these parallels between the social and physical climate coordination problems that arise from the unsustainable exploitation of unpriced goods and services and the very success of the market economy is really highlighting problems in the non-market economy. So there's a lot of interest in care. It's become a kind of buzzword, which I think is really great. And um, uh, a lot of different perspectives are emerging. And I, I wanna mention two important books that are situated much more in a, a traditional Marxian framework than mine is. The Care Manifesto is a, is a very moving and very powerful polemic about um, the consequences of living in a very uncaring world. And Emma Dowling's book is a, a little bit more policy oriented, focused more on the British case, uh, but also a, a, a fairly deep um, critique of capitalism per se. I, I think, uh, well, let me go back. I, I'm just gonna say that um, what I, uh, where I think both of these books and a lot of the other books about about the care crisis kind of fall short is that they're not, they treat capitalism itself as kind of the source of all evil with respect to uh, care shortages. And in this respect, I think they're really um, over simple. Um, and my dissatisfaction with that uh, tendency to lay all of the blame for care problems on quote unquote capitalism as a system is that's a lot of the motivation for what I'm I'm talking about today. So um, care is not all sweetness and love. I think sometimes it's treated as though, oh, this is the feminine side of, you know, love for others and nurturance and maternal uh, solicitude, et cetera. But care is also uh, very much implanted in uh, political struggle. You know, care for others is usually limited to members of an in-group, whether it's a family or a neighborhood or a nation state. Uh, and it's usually very restricted for what we think of as different kinds of out-groups. And if you, the history of the evolution of patriarchal systems makes it pretty clear that the care problems didn't begin with neoliberal capitalism or with plain old capitalism or with feudalism. There's a long history of patriarchal, racist and nationalist uh, hierarchies and power that reveals both direct coercion, force and violence and also indirect or institutional control. And slavery, I think as, a, uh, as it evolved on a global level is, is, is kind of a, a, very, a very good marker of that because it had elements of gender and race, ethnicity and nationality embedded in it. So the intersectional turn is more, uh, more widely appreciated or more, more widely developed in sociology than in economics. Um, but uh, I think what uh, one of its really important implications for political economy is that it, it, it points to, it urges us to think more, to appreciate the complexity of collective identity and, and conflict. And in particular, I think intersectionality leads us to reject some binary oppositions that are really embedded in social theory, like economic interests, class, economic standard of living versus social identities, uh, women, race, nationality, et cetera. I think social identities are important to economic interests and economic interests play an important part in social identities. So, Class divisions versus non-class divisions. Again, I think there's a continuum. It's not a binary. Exploitation versus oppression. I think one serious limitation of the traditional Marxian paradigm is it reserves the word exploitation for class inequality and sort of treats everything else as non-economic or a condition of existence of the economic, doesn't really extend economic. So to extend it, we really need to redefine what we mean by the economic, as it were. So there, there are four key terms that um, are especially important to the um, kind of political economy tradition. 
one of those is production. How, how are we going to define production? The other is mode of production, capitalism as a mode of production, um, feudalism, uh, primitive communism as modes of production, uh, social reproduction, which is a term that's now being more widely used, and then exploitation. These are all contested now, and I, I want to uh, just look at these definitions a little more closely. So in, in classical political economy, uh, the production of goods and services for consumption or exchange, that's production. But labor itself is not produced. It's set outside of the economy. And that's a tradition uh, that goes back in the English-speaking world to John Locke uh, and Adam Smith. It's, it's very, very deeply embedded in the history of liberal political theory as well as um, economics. And it's reflected today in a tremendous emphasis on gross domestic product as a measure of economic success, that is comparing countries in terms of the value of the goods and services that are produced through the market and leaving out uh, non-market uh, transfers and non-market interactions. And it needs to be expanded in a number of ways, but in particular, I believe it should be expanded to include care the production, development, and maintenance of human capabilities. So um, traditional Marxism depicts these specific transitions for modes of production that are defined in terms of the extraction of surplus and production. And I think this uh, is simplistic and it needs to be refined. It needs to be developed. It needs to be to some extent replaced with an understanding of systems as intersecting and overlapping structures of, of collective power. So when we look at early earlier examples of what we might think of as almost purely patriarchal societies without a whole lot of, of class differentiation, we see that they evolved with uh, class differences and racial differences and were mitigated in some respects, but reinforced in others. So it's creating this kind of um, uh, kind of contradictory and really interesting variation of different systems of of um, hierarchical power that uh, social scientists in general really need to uh, understand, rather than sort of assigning these one form of inequality to a particular historical epoch to think about how uh, inequalities have become over time progressively more complex and segmented. So you could think of it as sort of a fractal system, not just one pyramid of inequality, but a lot of intersecting inequalities. So social reproduction, here's a term that uh, actually appears in uh, a lot of early Marxist thinking, and I think early Marxist feminists did a lot to publicize its importance. But in that discourse, social reproduction is just really about the social reproduction of capitalism, about employers needing to uh, ensure a future labor force. And I think social reproduction is bigger than that. And I think that every society develops institutional structures to promote its social reproduction. And in fact, I think patriarchal institutions are a very important innovation in the history of the human species as a method of promoting social reproduction that entailed a lot of inequality and exploitation, but also had some functional results for the societies that, um, that implemented, that developed and implemented those institutional structures. So I don't know if any, if any of you have ever seen this image before, I use this slide in almost every talk I give because it's, I, I don't know, I just think it's a very powerful image of the importance of domestic labor, uh, the role that domestic labor plays in restoring the labor force. Uh, it's not just bearing children, although that's clearly a part of it. It's also maintaining the worker. You can see the workers coming out of the factory and then being kind of in on the assembly line called home sweet home, being kind of fed, clothed, and cared for so they, they can go back into the factory. So I think it's a good, you know, it's a thought-provoking image, but 
it's also a very limited image because it seems to, to imply that there are only two sites, the factory and the home. It doesn't really think, it doesn't, it doesn't look beyond those two sites. Uh, there's no racial or ethnic uh, differentiation of the workers. They're all kind of white faced, uh, homogeneous workers. Uh, and there's no, there are no national boundaries. Uh, so uh, I think this tension between capitalism and nationalism that we're, it's become particularly prominent today is partly a reflection of a tendency to think of nationalism as a kind of ideological or cultural uh, dimension rather than really recognizing that uh, national identity and membership, citizenship, citizenship in an affluent country is a very significant marker of access to economic resources um, and economic, global economic inequality. And then uh, I think this is the last term I'm gonna try to persuade you to rethink, exploitation. In traditional Marxism, it's only, it only happens under capitalism in wage employment and it's the expropriation of surplus value. And in the book and elsewhere, I argue for a more, a more general definition, I think actually more consonant with political theory, um, which is taking unfair advantage of uh, an individual or a group. And of course, that makes it difficult. That just kicks the can down the road, as we say, then what is unfair advantage? Well, I think that's something that requires collective and democratic definition and deliberation. Uh, and I also think it's something that we uh, need to eliminate or block or reduce to the fullest extent uh, possible because uh, unfair advantage becomes a major source of conflict that's very, very inefficient and very, very damaging to our sustainable welfare. So there are a lot of historical applications of this theoretical perspective. And in the book, I try to just select out a few ways of um, showing how this might help us understand uh, history better. And the topics that I cover include things like what are the origins of patriarchal and feudal hierarchical institutions, structures of collective power, what are some of their tensions with and synergies with capitalist institutions? What about colonialism? How does it how does it how does it contribute the way we think about colonialism? What does it tell us about welfare states and controversies over wealth, welfare states? And then the one I'm going to focus on <clears throat> primarily here uh, is changes in the shape of gender inequality. So that's not the only one, but I think my comparative advantage lies in thinking about that shapes of gender inequality. But um, I can't resist adding one thing, which I think is really um, relevant to our current political context, which is tensions between neoliberalism and populism in both Europe and the US. And I'm, I'm really eager to hear from you all uh, any thoughts that you have about um, this particular and very important question. So I'm gonna compress my argument here into like pretty much a one PowerPoint slide which is always a dangerous thing, but maybe also a useful thing. So I think there's a lot of evidence that at a very, very point, a point very long ago, a prehistorical point, patriarchal societies expanded at the expense of others, partly as a result of developing institutional control over women's re reproductive capabilities. And I think a lot of that had to do with the, mil the literally the military and economic advantages of having a large population. A lot of patriarchal um, institutions have a very distinctly pronatalist uh, impact and they reduce the cost of raising children for men um, in ways that uh, encourage men to buy into a very high fertility um, regime, which can have a, a pretty big social payoff. And I think likewise, a lot of the institutional hierarchies developed around race and nation and class um, 
were exploitative, but also provided some advantages to societies that developed those institutional rules. And they also amplified the concentration of military and economic power. And the, the evolution of these overlapping hierarchies kind of consolidated power at the top and promoted uh, social divisions. And I think it facilitated uh, co-optation. Um, Before I go there, I'll just I'll just say a little bit what I'm about what I mean by co-optation. Uh, what intersectionality implies is that people can be very privileged in some respects, like being a citizen of a very affluent country, and very disadvantaged in other respects, like being um, a very uh, poorly educated low wage worker, uh, or being a uh, A person of color, but also being uh, having inherited significant wealth and significant access to education. And women in particular, I think, um, are subject to this these intersectional dynamics because they have some interests as women, but women also pool income with men. And partnership and cooperation with men is pretty crucial to the process of social reproduction. Uh, so uh, women are also in a very good example of contradictory interests that you have some interest as a woman, but you also have some interest as a member of a couple or a family that give you uh, some incentives to preserve institutions that you think might work to the advantage of your family. So uh, uh, some policy changes that might improve your position in some respects uh, might harm it in others. The complexity of inequality, I think, makes people very risk averse about social change. Um, we know from a lot of research that people um, are very loss averse. That is, the loss of something, uh, the loss of some dimension of their of their in income or their privilege is much more salient to them than the lack of um, ability to expand it, and it. In a society where there are a lot of interlocking inter institutions, I think people are often very averse to changes that might destabilize um, the uh, privileges that they are, are are deriving from their current status quo. And I think nationalism, in case you didn't anticipate this, I think nationalism is a very good uh, indicator of this, uh, but that we see a lot of historical complexity and variation in the way these issues evolve. So um, why do I think uh, that the force of patriarchal institutions has declined? Well, and, and notice by the way, the title of my book is not the rise and fall. Sometimes people remember it as the rise and fall of patriarchal institutions because you know, some historian wrote a book about Rome that's famous, that's about the rise and fall. I don't think patriarchal institutions have fallen. In fact, I think they're persistent, but they're much, much weaker than they have been in the past. And I think actually capitalism created or capitalist development, I try not to use the noun capitalism. I think capitalism works better. Capitalist as an adjective is much more useful than capitalism as a noun, which tends to subsume everything else within it. So first of all, when you have new dimensions of inequality emerging, that is putting some women into privileged positions based on their uh, family membership uh, and group membership. Uh, and that creates a little dissonance because then not all women are treated the same and not all rules of patriarchal institutions apply to all women equally. Capitalist development really undermines families as units of production, especially when it pulls women into independent employment. So it creates more uh, source for economic autonomy uh, that uh, is effectively mobilized in efforts to politically demand uh, reform of institutions of family law, for instance, or access to the vote, for instance, uh, that, that, that have traditionally excluded women. I also think it's true that fertility decline 
uh, itself decreased women's specialization in, in reproductive work and in that way increased their bargaining power. That's where the prisoner of love that Peter mentioned in the beginning really comes in. You know, I think that a problem for mothers is that um, they often, they, well, it's also a blessing, not just a problem. But if you're completely, um, you know, if you're completely devoted to the care of a dependent, you're much less, much less likely to risk uh, engaging in actions that might have any um, negative implications uh, for them. You're much less likely to threaten to withdraw your services of care if you're very connected to and committed to the one that you you care for. And in fact, this is really key to a lot of historical, um, a lot of stories about the origin of patriarchal systems that you that women could be seized or attacked, taken hostage, impregnated, and then once impregnated, they were there. It was much more easy to control and domesticate them because their their commitment to their children reduced their mobility and increased their willingness to cooperate even on very unequal terms uh, as, as a necessary part of their, um, uh, you know, uh, accommodation to the status quo. And I think the emergence of feminist um, movements uh, in the last two centuries is sort of, is consistent with the story that sometimes you see women overcoming their differences and organizing collectively for their rights. But you also see this very uneven pattern that is mediated by a lot of, of differences in uh, class and race and ethnicity and so forth and so on. And there are big consequences here. Uh, for instance, I think uh, a good case can be made that feminist mobilization is generally more successful in societies without really high levels of class or race inequality, uh, and that it's really inhibited uh, to some extent when there's a, a, there are really intense levels of racial and class difference. I think that's relevant to what we think of as the Nordic model and why the Nordic model um, evolved in ways that are are more gender egalitarian than um, in many other, in most other parts of the world. Okay, so the persistence of patriarchal institutions also requires some explanation because there are those who will say that, oh, it's it's over, it's the end of men, women have won, you know, women, more women are going to college than men are, and, you know, we now live in a, a gender egalitarian society. I don't think that's true. Uh, we still see a lot of occupational segregation. Women in paid employment tend to be in the public sector and in health, education, and social services, where they pay a penalty in lower wages because they're producing a public good, among other reasons. Welfare state policies. I can't speak for the, for the Danish case or the Nordic case, but in the U.S. case, it's very clear that welfare state policies have reinforced women's specialization in, in, in care provision. And the structure of social security, our retirement program is a, is a very good example of that, um, as is our failure to enforce child support responsibilities effectively. So women have fewer children, that's been countervailed by increasing demand for child quality and also growing elder care responsibilities. Uh, and both employers and men have gained increased opportunities to free ride on women's care work. I mean, one of the one of the aspects of patriarchal systems that I think is uh, is sometimes underestimated is that it imposed pretty serious requirements on men. I mean, men derived a lot of of benefits, economic and social and sexual benefits from patriarchal systems. But those systems also, to a very large extent, enforced responsibility uh, for um, uh, the support of children in, in one way or, or another. And now, in, in, in many countries, we've moved towards a world where a lot of women are being raised by mothers alone without even, you know, without, in, without very much financial support not to speak of direct participation in the process of, of raising kids. 
Anyway, here's a comparison for the US that I think kind of drives home this point. If you look at um, wage differences in the US, women earn, women who are, are not married and have no children earn almost exactly the same as their male counterparts in the US. That's, that's amazing that we have seen that those um, women have gained tremendous access to economic independence. But on the other hand, women who are mothers or who take on responsibilities for the care of a dependent or disabled family member earn far less than their male counterparts. So one of the conclusions I draw from this is that um, capitalism has had kind of a contradictory effect. It's improved the position of women who are willing to pretty much follow a male model of commitments, uh, but it's really penalized um, those who uh, still uh, feel a strong commitment to the process of, of care provision that's, I think, uh, important and valuable to recognize and reward. So there are a lot of uh, systemic tensions, uh, systemic tensions today that I think are um, can be better understood through this framework. So we've seen a lot of contestation and delegitimation of many forms of discrimination, not just against women, but against um, uh, other groups defined in terms of their sexual orientation, uh, uh, racial uh, inequality, ethnic inequality, uh, I think our, our, our cultural values have really now really weigh against most forms of, of discrimination other than discrimination on the basis of citizenship, um, which I'll, I'll come to in a minute. Um, we're seeing, I, I think, a lot of, and it's very visible, it's very tangible, degradation of the social and physical environment. So climate change in the US is very now very, very visible. Coastal real estate is being flooded. Fires are devastating a lot of the West. You know, California flooding. Uh, th this is very apparent. But we're also saying the social environment is also uh, very much disrupted in different ways in different places. But in the US, one of the big symptoms of that is gun violence, um, which keeps accelerating in, in very uh, disturbing ways and uh, is not really effectively regulated or, or, or responded to uh, by the government. The, what what uh, Angus Deaton and Anne Case refer to as deaths of despair or an indication of degradation of the social environment. Deaths from addiction, from alcoholism, and suicide have really risen in the U.S. So for the first time uh, in many, many years, the average life expectancy in the U.S., especially for some groups, has actually declined. I think that's, that's I think, very much about a kind of social climate. And I think in early stages of globalization, corporate interests and national interests were very allied. And that's no longer the place. That's no longer the case. And so we're seeing, um, you could think of it as kind of a split in uh, the interests of employers and of uh, wealth owners in general between those who see their interests as uh, uh, kind of in the neoliberal way as free markets, you know, reduce trade restrictions, uh, open immigration. Um, there's definitely a pullback from that kind of neoliberal uh, uh, allegiance that's symbolized in the U.S. by the influence of Trump and the Trump wing of the Republican Party. But it's also very apparent in Europe uh, and elsewhere elsewhere. And this is really exacerbated by in, in the polarization of class divisions at the same time. Again, this may be unique to the US um, compared to Denmark, but we've seen very slow wage growth 
until recently, we've seen a little bit of growth in wages in the bottom 40%, but overall a trend towards really increased inequality, intensified global concentration of wealth. We've seen below replacement fertility has really come to the fore. A lot of publicity lately about the actual decline of the Chinese population. What does that mean for Chinese growth and development? Well, uh, we're all being forced to rethink a lot of aspects of our social organization uh, as a result of below replacement fertility. By the way, I don't, I don't think it's it's a crisis on any that is on anywhere near the level of climate change, um, and I think we can we have means of coping with it. But it definitely requires some thinking about uh, how we're going to uh, respond to it if we want, at some point in the future, to uh, establish uh, a stable population, a, a stable and sustainable global population. I think there's a political crisis of international migration because now it seems like there's kind of a conflict between what you might think of as class interests, workers of the world unite, and national interests, which is stay out of my country because I don't want you consuming uh, public services um, or jobs in ways that compete with my uh, economic well-being. And I think that's a, a really big issue of political principle on the left that has been inadequately addressed. Um, and it puts it, I think it's a terrible uh, and very difficult dilemma and I wish I had a solution for it, but I don't, I can urge us to think about it more critically and, and more comprehensively. Okay, so I'm done almost. Um, I just want to, by way of a, a, a review of what I've said, maybe, um, you know, sometimes academics like to tell a kind of, develop a kind of intellectual genealogy, like where did these ideas come from? Um, and what I've proposed here is kind of a hybrid, uh, a kind of hybrid theory, and it's plucking some ideas out from Marxian political economy, from neo classical institutionalist theory and also from feminist theory. Um, and, um, you know, what I think is really valuable about the Marxian tradition is this attention to collective identity and collective conflict, not just thinking about individual choice. I think the effort to understand the evolution of inequality in historical materialism is really inspiring. And I also think that Marxian emphasis on contradictions and crisis are really key. But as I've indicated, I think those concepts have to be extended beyond the dimensions to which Marxian theory has traditionally confined it. And I think a lot of neoclassical theory still clings to this every man for himself approach. Uh, you know, everybody should just make their own choices and we're better off, you know, not interfering. But it's also true that a lot of neoclassical economics is or what is called neoclassical economics. We could quibble over the definition, but a lot of it is actually quite creative and useful for thinking about the solution of coordination problems. I think I draw a lot on game theory in the book, and I think it's a really, a really useful tool. I think um, in particular cooperative bargaining theory, which is much less well-developed or it's not taught as nearly as much in economics curriculums as non-cooperative theory. Cooperative bargaining theory is about coalitions, formation of coalitions. Uh, and how, how do you create a coalition where in which everybody is slightly better off than they would be in the absence of the coalition? And I think that's kind of the key uh, to a vision of, of global cooperation. And then finally, this concept of free riding on public goods, that really grew out of the welfare economics uh, a kind of branch of, of neoclassical thinking. It's been renounced by, I mean, it's not been renounced really, but it, it's been de-emphasized by a lot of neoclassical economic thinking, but not, not completely ignored. But then, okay, I think what feminist, brings, feminist theory brings in, and that I'm trying to combine with these other elements, is this notion of this, how care is really crucial, 
women have some collective interests in common, especially as care providers, and that the, the collective struggle over the distribution of the cost of care is really relevant to gender inequality. So I'm going to end with the the bull of Wall Street again, and I think it's interesting that this uh, another financial services firm actually uh, paid for uh, this sculpture called Fearless Girl by uh, Kristen Visbal. There's been a lot of controversy over it. I think it's been removed uh, from Wall Street, but for a while that little fearless girl was facing uh, the bull somewhat uh, defiantly. And I think that's the, um, that's the spirit of the enterprise. Thank you very much. And I, I really look forward to any comments that you might have. Thank you, Nancy. So this was a very um, incompetent talk, really a, a big macro narrative that should uh, stimulate lots of this, uh, discussion and questions. Um, People can ask questions both through the hand function and, and the chat function. Uh, I leave it to you, Nancy, to pick them uh, from either the, uh, the hand function or the, or the chat function. Um, you cannot see them. They, you can hear them, but not see them. And we have about half an hour. For example, I see Elena Korminga. If people could also briefly introduce themselves as we cannot hear you, cannot see you, Please yeah. shortly introduce yourselves. Yeah, Elena, you're the first. Yeah, hi, thank you very much. Um, I have to introduce myself. Basically now I am um, writing a book about the emergence of patriarchy in the Russian empire and I concentrate on feudalism period. Great. Pre -capitalism. Great. Uh, so that's why I have a couple of questions, um, like two questions. I mean, I have a million questions, but two uh, <laughs> questions in particular right now about yeah. your concept of care. Yeah. Uh, did I understand correctly that you are considering care in a very broad like sense, but basically you are talking about motherhood. Um, so at least what I as how I understand it. Um, no, no, so, no, 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 no. I mean, motherhood is important to it, but I think you know anybody who's working as an educator, uh, as a healthcare provider, um, uh, caring for elderly people. Uh, in their family or in a uh, in a nursing home, I think they're also engaging in care provision. So yeah, I think I think to me this is a really crucial point uh, because I think sometimes care is defined just as unpaid work, but in fact a lot of paid work involves what I'm calling care. Yeah, yeah, and that's particularly what I'm uh, want want to ask because. Basically, all these rest type of care appeared quite recently, but mindful and meaningful motherhood, it's like something that appeared first. Uh, and in this case, I'm curious in, in the US, US case when you consider it appearing. And the second point, how exactly you're measuring gender inequality, especially if when we are talking about this period of feudalism and, capital, and early capitalism. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, patriarchal institutions emerged at a very early date uh, and were very much connected with feudalism, um, but not didn't originate with feudalism, but were actually systematized uh, in the European case very much during the feudal period. So among political theorists, a really good example is the work of Sir Robert Filmer, who basically argued that kings derived their authority uh, because they were derived from the first father, Adam. Uh, and I think Filmer's work, which um, I think has been underappreciated, kind of represents a, a very significant uh, formalization of the logic that connects uh, feudal class authority with, with patriarchal authority. Um, but we can see patriarchal institutions, you know, much, much earlier in history. And um, because a lot, to, to a large extent, they are emerging at the uh, prehistorical stage, it's pretty hard to actually provide a lot of uh, historical dating of it. But one of the things I, one of the, my favorite example which I urge you to take a look at in my book is, is sentences that I've just plucked out of 
of the Old Testament, the Bible, uh, that are describing uh, wars in which uh, women, women captured as the booty of war were to be taken as wives. Uh, and the, you know, the, the whole process of, of, uh, of group warfare involved this really important source of booty, which was uh, uh, command over a larger kind of reserve army of women. We have three uh, questions, uh, Nancy, in the in the uh, chat uh, Q and A window. If you want, I can read them out. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing the questions you in don't... my chat. Oh, mate, I just had the. Uh... It's in the Q and A. Um, I can read them out for you if you wish. Oh, it's in the Q and A. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, I'll just take them in in sequence. So there's one from from Ida or Ida Askaf Dalmer. Uh, you argue that. Or do you want to read it out, Ida, or shall I? Yes, so thank you for answering talks, she says. You argue that care work and social production should be considered in addition to production or enter GDP as a picture of the national economy. How do you as an economist imagine that this kind of work could be included in the numbers in practice? Uh, great question. I think there's already a lot of research on this underway, and it's largely based on time use surveys that uh, provide uh, estimates of the amount of time that people spend in different kinds of unpaid work and ask what it would cost if you had to purchase those services in the market. So I don't know if Denmark has developed a time use survey or a uh, satellite account, but many, many countries around the world, including the US, have already developed uh, these estimates. And it's beginning to be incorporated into macroeconomic modeling. So I think it's in, there are a lot of interesting details about it and they're, they're really, it's really worth digging into them. We have a question from Nina Bondrup uh, Dawn, uh, who asks, if we want to change the situation, what should we do at the different societal levels? Yeah, that's the hardest question of all, isn't it? Um, I think um, I think the main kind of political implication of my argument is that we need to think more about coalitions. Uh, that we need to stop insisting that, that you know our favorite form of exploitation should take priority over others, uh, and think about how do we get how do we form a, a coalition of of those people who have the most to gain from a transition to a more egalitarian and sustainable economic system. Um, and the way that we do that depends entirely on who we are and where we are. Uh, it very, I think it will always be very, there will never be a general prescription. It will always be a difficult strategic decision for people on the local level. We have a question, uh, Nancy, from uh, David Palomera in Barcelona, who asks if I wonder if Nancy could talk a little more about how the welfare state reproduces gender roles. I think he says that the welfare state has a more contradictory role, both reproducing but also disrupting gender roles. David, I think that's a very good point. Uh, I think it does have a contradictory role, but I'll give you an example of how. I'll give you a couple of examples from the US that are on the side of, of reproduction. You know, uh, Social Security in the US, and I think this is similar in many European pension programs, is a pay-as-you-go system. That is um, support for the older generation in terms of pensions and also healthcare is largely based on a tax on the working age population. But the benefits that are received through pensions in particular are based entirely on how much was earned in the labor market. They're based on earnings history. So people who like many mothers, including especially single mothers, actually put a lot of time and energy into raising the next generation. And as a result, have a 
less of an earnings history and lower lower wages get get less from the uh, system than uh, people who devote their entire life to developing enhancing their earnings record and um, don't really participate in in the process of 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 the next caring for the next generation or even caring for existing uh, uh, people. And I think that's that's a kind of intergenerational intergender transfer that has uh, has really contributed to a very high rate of poverty among single mothers of, in particular um, in the US. Um, and it also means that women become, as a result of this, it means that women uh, become more dependent on a, a commitment to a male breadwinner who can earn more and help them uh, reduce those costs. And the the uh, you know the benefits that are provided to married couples in the U in the U.S. are much much greater than the benefits that are provided uh, to people who are not married. So you can be a housewife in the U.S. and not raise any kids at all, but if you're married to a high earner, you get his pension benefit is enhanced. So you you know that really reinforces a traditional breadwinner role. Um, again, I think those that's an example of a policy that exists in some other countries, but not all uh, countries. But uh, you know, other factors include things like joint taxation or or um, uh, poor enforcement of child res uh, uh, support responsibilities. I hope that I hope that speaks to your question. Are there any more questions? If not, I'll happily jump in. But I see Virginia Zaruli. Virginia, please introduce yourself. Am I unmuted? Am I unmuted? Yes. Yes, thank you. you. Yeah. So thank you very much for the interesting presentation. I have a comment and I would like to, to know if you have any thoughts of, or your, your opinion about the labor market seg segregation. So yeah. we know that women tend to be segregated in, this, in those sectors, they pay less. You know, like, of course, the, um, those, care, the, those sectors that are re related to care pr provision. Yeah. But uh, in the last years, we also see a tendency for the sectors that see an increase in female participation to somehow lose a value. An, an example could be like uh, high um, education, un universities, more women are university professors and pretty much everywhere gov governments are cutting funds, you know, to research yeah, yeah. institutions yeah. and, and, and universities. So my question is, um, you know, it, are these dynamics a way of patriarchal so society to reshape itself within capitalism or is, or is rather capitalism that actually reshapes itself and needs oh, different types of patriarchy? Uh, so these are my questions, and I, I would like to know what you think. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really great uh, point uh, and a really a really good comment. Um, I think that um, there is definitely a kind of tipping phenomenon uh, that when women move into uh, an occupation, it tends to lower the average level of earnings and also the level of public support for it. And I think uh, the main thing that is driving this from the capitalist direction is that uh, workers' bargaining power is determined by their wa wages available elsewhere in the economy. So, um, so this is a, you know something that economists refer to with a fancy name, hysteresis. What it means is that once there is a lot of inequality in wages, Employers know that there's inequality in wages, so they make lower wage offers to those who have been historically uh, disempowered. So uh, that is a way, you know, that's an example of how the, the greater bargaining power of employers in the labor market compared to workers is, is definitely helping reproduce uh, gender inequality. Um, so, 
Um, there I was going to say something about, oh, oh, and the, but then there's also this, this prisoner of love dynamic. A lot of women um, actually choose, they make a positive choice to specialize in care provision, whether it's unpaid care or to choose to go into health, to go into uh, education and so forth. And that's a part that that responsibility is a part of the social construction of femininity. And I think it's also true that care provision is very intrinsically rewarding. And especially once you begin providing care and you become attached to those you're caring for, it's very difficult to withdraw and say, I'm quitting because uh, I'm not, I'm not earning enough to be economically independent. You know, once you, and it's also true that you you know commitments. Uh, all commitments are kind of costly, uh, in a way that limits the bargaining power of of workers. So in in the academy, you know one of the reasons that support for public education is declining in this country is that there's kind of a huge reserve army of women who 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 want to pursue academic careers. Uh, because their other options are for interesting and rewarding jobs are very limited, uh, and also because they they want to be in a in a caring teaching environment. So that, I think that's a good example of what I mean by the kind of co determination of class and and gender dynamics, and I think there are also big racial, ethnic dynamics uh, that are are part of the story. And there's also some technological change thrown into the mix that that we have this very technology that we're using right now, Zoom, is really altering the kind of economic logic uh, of education provision in ways that are contradictory. On the one hand, it's really great that we can have an international uh, conversation and exchange of ideas like this. On the other hand, um, it makes us all more substitutable. Uh, it reduces our bargaining power as academics in 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 a nation state. You know, why why does a country need to finance education if it can just give students a laptop and tell them to take online courses from all over the world? So ooh, I didn't mean to sound so negative about academic careers, but I think a lot of a lot of things are combining to make it a very uh, you know, economically uh, risky specialization. All right, so maybe let me jump in if I may, Nancy. And uh, we've had a dialogue for, for a number of years now, so needless to mention, I'm <laughs> fully convinced by the emphasis on care and this notion of the development and uh, sustenance uh, of uh, capabilities. But I'm also thinking, okay, um, clearly we, we ideally would like to go beyond that. Yeah, I'm thinking, for example, about this wild uh, presidential address by James Coleman to the American Sociological Association 1992 on yeah. the rational reconstruction of society, where he really was very bold. Nothing of his uh, plea uh, happened, but he said, as a social science community, we should be actually able to say, okay, sure, we need to raise the next generation through care. But clearly, um, you know, a, a child needs to have shoes, obviously, to flourish. So far, so good. So clearly, it shouldn't be shoes that are, you know, defective or too small. Neither should it be $250 Nikes every five months. Yeah? By which I mean, of course, that, you know, class, of course, is in the intersectionally involved here. Coleman claims, and ideally we would agree with him, but how to do it is the question, that we should be able to um, determine the true value added of parents. Uh, and yeah. separate it from, you know, the consumption value of children or the, the negative uh, contribution uh, that even people like James Heckman mentioned very often of yeah, families. Good uh, point. And any thoughts on that? How to rationally construct society beyond changing tax regimes and- uh, Well, I, I think, um, Coleman's not the only one who's argued that we should kind of commodify child rearing. That is, you should be paid on the basis of your contribution. So if you raise a productive child, 
you should right. be rewarded more than if you if you raise a criminal. But uh, in fact, there's uh, a really interesting proposal made by a U.S. economist Shirley Burgraff that mm -hmm. argues that we should dismantle Social Security and just give parents a legal right to a share of their children's earnings. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, but I think what's misplaced about this is the notion that you can that you can commodify. Uh, human capabilities. I don't think you can. It's very, uh, you know, it's very unpredictable. There are a lot of forces that are at work. It, it, you know, there's certain activities that you can't organize on the basis of people should get their marginal product because you can't possibly measure the marginal product. And I think this neoclassical idea that people should be paid their marginal product doesn't work in a lot of areas, but it especially doesn't work in parenting. Uh, and I think, I mean, actually, I think the reason why we have moral values and why we are all looking for more cooperative uh, uh, arrangements is that we recognize on some fundamental level that we can't, we are more than a market. Some markets work really great for some things and they don't work at all for others. That's kind of my premise. Tiziana. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Nancy, for the brilliant talk and for the organizer to uh, let us uh, take part of it. Uh, that was very generous, uh, very much appreciated. I have uh, a question which regards some points that uh, you briefly talked, uh, but you briefly touched, but you re didn't really develop uh, uh, because of constraints. And it has to do with the cost to revert choices uh, and the fact that oftentimes uh, caring uh, is, um, as, as well as um, labor attachment, is a process, is not a, a, a timing point action. And both uh, uh, caring responsibilities and the capacity to find a job uh, change over time. The more you invest in caring, the less uh, opportunity you have to get back uh, eventually to the labor market. So in this respect, how does time and space matter in individual's life? And uh, yeah, yeah. some caring can be shared and some cannot. So you can share caring uh, uh, with your kids yeah. or with your brothers, uh, but some some uh, with your partner, but some caring cannot, or with your co-workers, but some caring cannot be shared. Yeah, I completely agree. And that's why, I, I mean, I think you said that really well. Um, I'm trying to think of sort of the best way to uh, address what you said. Um, I think uh, the current kind of, kind of form intersection of patriarchal and capitalist institutions uh, in the U.S. in particular, but the global economy in general, makes care provision very costly. And I think uh, below replacement fertility is one indicator of that. But I also think the deterioration of the social environment uh, is also uh, a result of that. And I think that's unsustainable, uh, inefficient and unsustainable, in addition to being unfair. And what that implies to me is that the policy agenda is not just child allowances, it's not just childcare, it's also kind of reorganizing um, the world of paid work so there's more complementarity with the provision of care and the earning of income. Uh, and that also means kind of changing our scoreboard. And instead of judging our success in terms of, of money or GDP or GDP growth, we should be measuring our success in terms of uh, the development of human capabilities. And a very, very good example of that is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, I think those Sustainable Development Goals, very carefully specified, are very much about care and capabilities. And the fact that to really reach them effectively, we need uh, less uh, conflict between paid work and unpaid work, and we need more reward for forms of paid work that develop human capabilities. 